Hey everyone, this is Adam Ganser, along with my buddy, Abe Epperson. And we are full-time directors for Crack.com. This show is going to be called Director Peace Theater, in which we discuss famous filmmakers and some of the quirks that make them unique. They wanted us to do more work, so they gave us a show. <laughs> so that's why you're here, and that's what... <laughs> and now to earn our pay. So the first entry in our series is going to be about James Cameron. We've all seen some James Cameron films. How do you feel about James Cameron? I love this topic so much because today we're going to be talking about James Cameron and his very interesting kind of uh, career with water. Yeah, James Cameron has spent his entire Hollywood career battling a deep, not even subconscious fear of water and has decided to tackle that fear by way of building mech suits and punching it to death. Yeah. Starting with his first and little known directorial debut, the sequel to 1978's Piranha, Piranha 2 The Spawning. Centuries, nature's most ferocious killer, until now. I was surprised, number one, that this was a movie. Yeah, we're gonna submerge into the depths and we're gonna fight these piranhas. <laughs> That's they, right. This came out in 1981. So for those of you who are not familiar with 1978's Piranha, that was almost a Jaws movie. Mm -hmm. It was a B-horror film Jaws movie. And James Cameron took over the sequel and made a couple of very interesting changes to the story. Number one, the lead of the film is a scuba diving instructor. Which will become key later when you realize that that's all James Cameron ever wants to be. That's correct. <laughs> Number two, the villain is an evil sea monster, which of course he did inherit that concept because he has to have mutant piranhas. Yeah, and they're mutated because of what? I'll tell you everything I know. Now my ass could end up in jail for this, but I'll tell you. We spliced in genes from different species to create the ultimate killer organism. military experiments. <laughs> so now we're getting to it. Technology, are we going too far? Have we not gone far enough? These are the questions James wants us to ask. So more interesting than that is one of the big changes that Cameron made to this film is that he placed the sea monster's lair in a sunken ship, which is why he needed a scuba diving lead because they needed to basically investigate a sunken ship to defeat the evil mutant piranhas. You've gotta be kidding. And this becomes really important later because right in those three examples, you now have kind of laid the scene of his future career. That's right. So we're going to kind of look through these, like the idea of your lead being, you know, a water submersible person. The villain has, is some kind of human interact, uh, intervention, or let's just call it the unknown, some magic monster, some alien or something like that will be the force that's driving, you know, the horror or the conflict. So up next in his filmography, we're going to skip Terminator. Why? Because Terminator doesn't fit with our theory. Yeah. So therefore, it doesn't, doesn't matter in cinema history. He, he had to, he has, he, as you know, James Cameron likes to take breaks sometimes. And we're just seeing Terminator 1 as just his break from water. But the big hitter that we're talking about here is 1986 Aliens. Another sequel. Yeah, interesting how many sequels he did even after he'd done Terminator. So how does Aliens fit in with this theory, Abe? Cameron makes a few key decisions that build his narrative within an already existing world. So he's already done this twice. In particular, Aliens, the colony is where all the action takes place is abandoned and corroded, similar to a sunken ship. I think Adam wants to talk about the aliens a little bit. That's right. I think a key observation, silly as it may be, those aliens are always wet. They're so wet. They're really wet. The aliens are not depicted as slimy and wet in the mm. original Alien movie. So Cameron mm. slime wetted it up with these aliens, making them bizarrely moist. Okay, but here's, an, here's another additional fact about the water that I thought was interesting. So Ripley is discovered in her abandoned ship, and that ship is coated with condensation. All kinds of water just floating everywhere in that spaceship, which again, I think is interesting, as though she's being pulled from a watery grave back to life, mm -hmm. right? And so she becomes, and this is another key ingredient to Cameron's ocean fear, she becomes sort of pulled back from a watery grave to combat the fear. That's her job. She literally doesn't have any expertise at all in this movie. Mm -hmm. She just has seen the alien before. One could say she's a fish out of water. <laughs> no! She's not in her own time anymore. She doesn't know how to understand like the basics of space travel. So she's really as unknown as it gets. Not only that, she's in the middle of space. And you brought up the condensation thing. Again, that's actually a great point because if we look at the technological safety of these movies, come from the idea that we're in a submersible, much like James Cameron did in much of his life. This is a man who already looks at 
the safety between the cold, terrible depths and him is essentially just like a few inches of steel. So yes. you got to stay on the ship. You, you can't leave the ship. Right. Everything out there is terrible and horrifying. So obviously in Aliens, when we get to the colony, the reason why it's so horrifying is the alien can kind of just come out of anywhere, from the ceiling, under you, from the side of the wall. So it's like he's the king of the environment. So that's where the horror comes from, is just this idea that Ripley is fighting an alien in which she doesn't know where it is. It comes from anything. At one point, she fights the aliens with literal fire, which um, I don't know if you know anything about the elements, but uh, water, fire have a, a dualistic relationship. That's true. I have played Final Fantasy, so I do require. I do see, remember that's that. That's how I see the world. Is like, how is it like Final Fantasy? Right. And then it makes sense to me, or it doesn't. I think that's a good point. I think Ripley fighting the aliens with fire is an interesting choice because we've already seen that it doesn't work in the first Alien movie one of those people goes up into the ducts and tries to flamethrow an alien, and it doesn't work. It doesn't stop the alien at all. And yet, in James Cameron's movie, that's basically how Ripley single-handedly takes down the alien queen, right? So he just makes a break with canon there. Why? Because this is how he visualizes fighting against an ocean-type water, predator. Water is evil right. and fire dries it up. And so there's one last element of this story that I think Bear is mentioning, and that is that Ripley learns how to use a giant mech suit to finish off this alien queen, which is a thing that we're going to see a lot in his filmography. There's always a mech suit, there's always a giant technological invention that must be used to combat the ocean. Otherwise, you know, you die. So let's move on to the next film that he did, Abe. What do you think about uh, 1989's Abyss? This is the first film that he takes on the subject directly. This is in its own world. He created it. And the whole movie takes place on, you guessed it, a stranded ship. A submarine is wrecked in this uh, ocean trench. Yes. And the team is not supposed to be here. The villain is manifest as a kind of telekinetic being made out of seawater, which was crazy because if you want to take a side, this is the, one of the first like real big industrial light magic CG characters. You know, mm -hmm. obviously Terminator had little bits of it, but it's just all over the place. And as we see in the, you know, spoilers, when they shut the the doors and the, and the the water beast just falls to the ground and they like taste it and they're like it's just seawater. So it's not actually because tasting is how you identify yeah, your villain. Mm, mm, <laughs> this is the most James Cameron you can get. The villain, quote unquote, the the unknown is literally something that is just made of water. And uh, we learn later that it's this kind of telekinetic jellyfish. Yeah, alien jellyfish. <laughs> alien basically. jellyfish that just can control water at will. Yeah. And that's just a part of their deal. And back to the production side of things, this was like a horrible movie to make. Not only will all the, all the actors, Ed Harris famously won't talk about James Cameron in interviews because he just hates the man. They had a fight. He punched him in his face. One of the reasons was is that at one point when they were filming an underwater thing, they would hide in these little stations while they were filming you know, Ed Harris going through these tubes. They would hide these little oxygen tanks uh, so that they wouldn't have to call cut. He would just get more air and then they would, he would just go through the scene. And at one point in the many, many takes that I'm sure James Cameron did, James Cameron moved the little oxygen tank further down the tube to the point that Ed Harris didn't know where it was. Ooh. So he was drowning wow. and he's like, where is this thing? And it, James Cameron reportedly said that he wanted him to actually feel fear. Like he, he looked good on camera. I guess you get the impression some of it was great, some of it was hell. So it's trying to understand it, which maybe I never will completely, but It was not, I never, I have not regretted the experience for a second, I mean, you know, even when I was down there, no matter what was going on. Another thing that's interesting about the abyss that's on this point is that in a deleted scene, the jellyfish aliens actually cause a string of tidal waves to stand on the brink of almost every earth shore. Right? And so they're literally going to annihilate Ma humanity. Yeah. Massive right? tidal waves. That's right. And then they sort of pose it at Ed Harris, like, we're doing this. And then Ed Harris fortunately had texted his bae mm -hmm. earlier. With the little uh, wrister dude. Yeah, that's right, with the wrister text. 
He texted his bae, telling him that he loved her, and so they were like, oh, love, that's cool. Because they're showing him images projected against, oh, guess what, water. And it's like, here's humanity, it's got love, children, they're all great. It's just like this iPhone ad, essentially, that just displays in front of Ed Harris. like, why are you showing me? <laughs> it really and is. And then they're like, hold on, there's more, and then shows all of, like, war and Vietnam and just, like, all these terrible things that humanity does to himself. But Ed Harris is like... I'm going to sacrifice myself. I'm okay. It's fine. I'm right. just going to die here. And they're like, nah, man, yeah. it's cool. That's a chill DM, man. Yeah. And you know what? Because of that, you get to save the world. We're not going to destroy all of the coastal cities on the earth. Right. It's interesting that thematically the ocean wants to destroy all of humanity, right? Mm-hmm. Like it, they just want to destroy everybody. But then they see that text yeah. and they're like, eh, it's pretty cool. Oh, That's man. a good DM, man. Oh, dude, use the crying emoji. That is <laughs> so... Hey. Hey, it's fun! That's impossible. Okay, let's move on to his next movie, which is 1991's Terminator 2, Judgment Day. Heard of that? Now, we didn't talk about the first Terminator because there wasn't a lot there that connected with the themes in the rest of his filmography, but this movie has quite a bit of it, actually. Two years before, he was like, I made a water monster. What if I just make a shiny version? And boy, oh boy, did we eat it up. That's right. T-1000 was essentially a water-based liquid monster. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what it is. And also, one of the coolest villains in the history of cinema. Another sequel in the franchise. Yes. And once again, this villain, this liquid villain, is destroyed by fire and by freezing. Those Mm -hmm. are the two ways that you can combat this villain. So again, the themes play out. Uh, A hero that is out of time, a fish out of water. All right, so then he makes 1994's True Lies, in which Jamie Lee Curtis wets herself down before she strips. So, so 1997 Titanic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the theme carries on. This is the most compelling and obvious example. Let's just go through like kind of the basics. The inciting incident of the film is Bill Paxton, dressed like a hipster pirate or something. He's looking for the heart of the ocean. Everyone dies in the ocean by freezing or drowning, obviously. Jack has to sneak aboard the Titanic and further exacerbates his out-of-placeness by seducing a rich girl with his drawing skills and dancing. I think that's why she liked him. I think that's why. Yeah. And she, isn't she supposed to be like 15 or something? <laughs> I don't know what ages they're supposed to be. It's uh, timeless. <laughs> It's a timeless tale. It's definitely a timeless tale of love, that's for sure. Yeah, but Titanic, you know, is obviously the movie everybody will always remember James Cameron for. That's his crowning achievement. But it has the fully formed ocean fear in it, right? You have an oceanographer looking for the heart of the ocean in a submarine around the wreck of the Titanic. And then you go back in time and watch the actual story where a fish out of water guy seduces somebody who's basically beyond his pale in terms of attractiveness, I guess. Mm-hmm. And they both drown together, right? One of them survives, but the other one drowns, and that's the story. It's the story of a whole ship going down. Pretty cool, huh? Well, then that old lady, old lady Rose, after troubling everyone with her very long story, throws it into the ocean, the $5 million part of the ocean. She's just like, you can take it, Jack. Jack's not going to use it. No, he's not. Bill Paxton, the whole reason he brought you on board is to get this damn also, diamond. Also, a quick argument. How much did you think it took? It cost to charter that sub out there anyway? Well, that's... that's what, they, not, they spent more than a heart of the ocean's worth of money in order to get this heart of the ocean. All we've done so far is just kind of doing these loose metaphors to kind of say, like, this is a similarity, this is a similarity. But this is now in his career where things get really interesting. It is. And this is where our thesis kind of begins to take hold. Because he wanted to make Titanic, like, 10 years before. Yes. He, like, wrote it. That's right. But the technology wasn't there. So Correct. he waited for it. Yes. to happen and once the technology i.e. filming technology was there and in 1985 when they actually found the Titanic he wasn't a part of that expedition but that just oh man he loved that that was his favorite he, he was just like you know what I'm gonna gotta go down there. I need to and see he it for did. myself. He just went down to the Titanic and funded his own excursion. And so this is now where we see the technology not only of filmmaking, but of like oceanography, essentially. Yes. Is that it's constantly trying to catch up to James Cameron. Like he's ahead of the curve. Yes. He has all these things he knows he wants to accomplish. Yeah, and it's and, and what's interesting is there's so much self-filming going on mm. during Titanic. Like, there's all kinds of behind-the-scenes things that are b- being made. Basically, James Cameron is really interested in capturing himself making this movie. Yeah, it, it, you he's know? literally the hero of his own life story. That's right. right? This, so. is, this is when he starts to actually invade his own narrative as a protagonist overtly. So for the next 12 years after Titanic, he just makes deep-sea documentaries where he and or just other people that he hires go down and film sunken ships 
Coast and stuff. He produced and directed over nine documentaries about the ocean after he had already made Titanic for three right. years. So he's like, I'm not done, Ocean. I need to still <laughs> know your secrets. That's right. It's like, I think he's he thinks that he's going to find some mer people down there. Like, that's his yeah. main thing. He's like, and then he'll be the king of the mer people. <laughs> So he spends 12 years after Titanic making deep sea documentaries and then comes back with his first major motion picture and that motion picture is Avatar. Now, we all know he's going to make Avatars for the rest of his life. If you look at IMDb, he's he's got five slated to go now, apparently. But what's interesting is Avatar is where the narrative starts to actually change. So instead of the sea creatures being this threatening, destructive thing, now the sea creatures are the subject of empathy. They're like right? land sea creatures. That's right. Yeah. So because if you look at the Navi, they're basically, which by the way, Navi, Navi, come on. Yeah. They're basically sea cats, mm -hmm. you know, and their world is essentially an underwater bioluminescent on land world. Land. That's and they it. have like strange angler type appendages. Yeah. They're literally the color of the ocean. Yeah. The world itself is like bioluminescent, which is how things survive in the deep. You know, so it kind of, it, it looks as much as an underwater aquarium as you can on land. That's right. And the villain this time, instead of being the, normally it would be the human beings trying to combat these creatures. This time, the villain is the evil military wearing mech suits who are trying to steal their resources. And what's interesting, though, is the Na'vi are not capable of destroying this military on their own. What do we need? We need a hero who dons a mech suit to become a Na'vi and fight as a Na'vi back against the military. So mm -hmm. Cameron's gone full Cameron here. He's made a mech suit that makes you a Na'vi so you can fight a mech suit. And this represents a pretty significant turn narratively for Cameron because after having spent 12 years in the ocean, now now suddenly he has a different take on it, right? Suddenly now he feels more at peace with it. He can defend it. He, he feels there's value there that's worth preserving, right? Yeah, I mean, he's this wealthy, like essentially titan of industry. For lack of a like he's not an Elon Musk, but he's pretty polymath as far as it goes, right? That's right. And so he's building an industry of the most winningest movies of all time, putting that money into actual exploration on the earth. This is kind of important for Avatar because his views have changed, yes, and uh, he's building these mech suits to find this quote unquote unobtainium. Uh, yeah, the the wonderfully named unobtainium. Yeah, yeah, which has been in like five different movies. It's also in the core. It's just like yeah. when people just don't want to be a screenwriter. Yeah, they just go to unobtainium is yeah. is the equivalent of the MacGuffin project. Uh, uh, the unobtainium, though, I think the only reason you can justify it as a choice is with this narrative of of Cameron fighting the ocean. Right? It's that there's something down there that you can never get. So this evil corporation is trying to get this thing you can never get. And Cameron, seeing the man he was, afraid of the ocean, having now come to peace with it after 12 years of documentary making, decides, I'm going to out-mech the mech maker. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a man go through a mech suit, become a blue sea cat, and fight back against the evil Cameron that used to be. <laughs> this is his redemption story, yeah. Avatar. Or maybe it's just Dances with Wolves in 3D, I'm not sure. So my favorite thing about Cameron, about this narrative, and, and this is how it resolves, is in 2012, Cameron decided to level up by manning the deepest solo dive in history and made a film of himself doing it. So he literally built a giant submersible mech suit, went in it himself down to the deepest place that human beings have ever gone, and made a film about it. And that is the ultimate Cameron move. He's he will the never make man. That's right. He's the he will deepest. never he will never more conquer his fears than this moment. And it's surprising cuz when like, he came back up and you know they're like you did it James. Hey, where'd you get that trident? <laughs> you know like <laughs> he must have met, you know, Navi people down there or something or maybe it was the jellyfish. Yeah. Maybe it was the jellyfish. Hey everybody, uh, thank you for watching that. Make sure you click the big C to subscribe uh, and click one of the videos to my right to watch other funny videos. Make sure you click on that dumb YouTube bell so you get notifications when we put out new videos. And if you're still looking for something to do, call your parents. Tell them you love them. And call mine too. Uh, I forgot to.